it's getting warm up there and i'm just beginning to thaw the seas and the lakes and the oceans are boiling over and i've been underneath it all salt was all there was for me and I traded my legs for fins so I could breathe half in your world in mine they couldn't hold me down I transcend her I'm not your kind I'm free magic on After swimming through death and life, I fear no hell. Ooh, I'm half in your world, half in mine. They couldn't hold. I'm not your kind I'm free Magic Thank you, Aviva. Thank you so much for opening our, our event this morning. That was lovely. Good morning, everybody. My name is Tina Roth Eisenberg. I'm the founder of Creative Mornings and your New York City chapter host. Um, <laughs> so this is our fourth IRL event since the pandemic happened upon us, and I'm still super emotional. <laughs> I wonder when this is going to wear off because I. The 18 months of doing Zoom events have really shook me to the core, to be honest. Uh, I also, I not only want to welcome all of you here, IRL, but also all of our live stream people tuning in. It's just so lovely that we offered it now, and I want to give a shout out to Patrick, who has like the most super pro live stream set up over there. And I want to acknowledge that I'm welcoming you from the ancestral land of the Lenape people and uh, we recognize the significance of Brooklyn and New York City for Lenape people, past and present. I want to thank Lucien and his team for so generously hosting us again. And a shout out to Frank, who's in the back there. He's our landlord. Um, if you're not familiar with the Invisible Dog, this magical building is actually an art center that Lucien runs. And there's, so this is an exhibition space. and. There's performances, you should check out their, their calendar on their website. Um, there's gonna be exhibitions coming up September onward. 
and then also there's two floors of artist studios above us and next to us. And then I, I actually run a co-working space on the third floor called Friends Work Here, where Creative Mornings is working out of. So you're basically in our living room right now. Um, every month we read the manifesto. Uh, we have a, someone special within our community that we ask to come on stage and read it. And the manifesto really shines a light on our values and why we do what we do. And today, that wonderful human is Connie Liu. Uh, she is a huge anchor in our volunteer community. She has been, she's a freelance video producer and has been filming and editing our events since 2015. And before that, she was the Creative Mornings video producer uh, in the Boston chapter for three years. So Connie de deserves a gold medal of volunteering. And it's incredible how many people around the world have been able to watch these talks because of her generosity of editing and filming these talks. So give a rock star round of applause for Connie. <laughs> Thank you, Tina. Everyone is creative. A creative life requires bravery and action, honesty and hard work. We're here to support you, celebrate with you, and encourage you to make the things you love. We believe in the power of community. We believe in giving a damn. We believe in face-to-face -face connections, in learning from others, in hugs, and high fives. We bring together people who are driven by passion and purpose, confident that they will inspire one another and inspire change in neighborhoods and cities around the world. Everyone is welcome. Thank you, Thank you. Raise your hand if this is your first Creative Mornings. Welcome, welcome. Um, I, before the pandemic, I used to have this tradition that I would always say you can come and op up to me afterwards and I'll give you a hug. I'm totally bringing it back. I will hug you all if you come up to me afterwards. Um, we're just so happy that you found us. And first timers often don't realize that we are actually happening all around the world and not just in New York. We're actually happening in 224 cities and 67 countries every month. And some of the, the, the really fascinating thing and I'm really humbled by the fact is that we actually grew during the pandemic. There were 16 chapters that uh, were born during the pandemic and these hosts knew that they would have to start out with virtual, which is, just shows how resilient this community is. And some of the, some of the four most recent chapters that launched are Ribeiro Preto, Clepeda, Bodrum, and just a few weeks ago, Fayetteville. And it's a true testament to the resilience of our community and I would say to humanity in general. Uh, which makes me want to honor and highlight our three chapters in, the, in Ukraine, uh, the chapters in Odessa, Kiev, and Lviv. They are going through an incredibly heartbreaking time, and um, our hearts go out to them, and all the places in the world that are experiencing un injustice and, and uh, hate. Um, we have no words for the heartbreak pouring out of Ukraine, Uva Uvalde, Buffalo, Laguna Beach, Sunset Park, and the countless other places. In times like these, we at HQ, we turn to our community and our incoming Creative Mornings Buffalo host, Naila Ansari, blessed us with these following words that I wanna share with you. It is happening now, not 50 years ago, but now you are killing us, but you could never kill our spirit. Even with an evil, our joy, joy will flourish beyond the skies. When tragedy pierces our communities, it is the pain that lingers in hopes and change that is needed now as we hold our community together with love. It seems as these days, getting out of bed, staying optimistic, and is an act of bravery and resilience. Creative Mornings is gathering kind, creative, heart-forward humans like you around the world every month. In fact, about 25,000 people. And seeing photos pour in from around the world from these events gives me and my team hope. You being here today gives me hope. You showing up matters. You giving a damn matters. You being kind to the person sitting right next to you right now matters. You believing that things can be better than we are better than this matters. Lucien offering his space to us matters. 
Our volunteers offering their time to help us make this happen matters. And the financial contributions of our partners to make this engine of generosity happen all around the world matters too. And these are companies that really give, give a damn, that really care about this creative community meeting up. And I want to thank them. Our local partner that makes breakfast possible is Harvest. They're just like us, a New York City-based company. And they're a, fam a favorite time-tracking uh, company. And if there's a problem bubbling up uh, when it comes to managing your work, they have a lot of resources on their site that I highly recommend you check out. Get harvest.com slash resources. They're ranging from invoice templates to project pricing, pricing guidelines, et cetera. And then my team and I, we don't just run the, the New York chapter, we actually run the global organization at large. And because of our global partner MailChimp, we are actually able to do that. Uh, the staff and resources he takes to onboard hosts, to run our website, et cetera, is, is all made possible by MailChimp. They've been supporting us for 13 years. Uh, we've grown together as organizations. I have so much gratitude for MailChimp. Without them, we wouldn't be here today. And if you want to find out how you stack up against your peers, they have a benchmark report that just came out by MailChimp and Co. Um, you find insights uh, from freelancers and agencies across the world that have uh, filled out their survey. It's going to be in the follow-up email. Are you still with me? Uh, thank you to all of you who brought plants uh, for the plant swap. Before you leave, if you're a plant fanatic, take some with you. If you're a little scared, you can do it. You can DM me on Swiss Miss. I'll coach you through growing your plant. Just make sure to take them with you. Like, to, I, it's actually funny. Somebody came up. We had some plant swaps before a few years ago. And I actually brought babies from the baby that I got. And she brought the same. From, we had from the same mother plant, we brought babies, which is really cute. So make sure to take advantage and, and discover your green thumb if you don't have it yet. Um, all right, this is my favorite thing to do at Creative Mornings. I get so excited. It's called Stand Up If. The rule is very simple. I'm going to project sentences to the, to the screen. And if these statements apply to you, please stand up. If you can't stand up, just raise your hand. All right, stand up if you consider yourself a creative person. Hell yeah, hell yeah. Um, stand up or keep standing if you have attended other Creative Mornings chapters. Can you shout out where? <laughs> Moscow, wait, what? <laughs> Can anyone beat in terms of distance Moscow? Okay. Oslo? Auckland. Oh, d damn. All right. Can you come up to me afterwards? I want to talk about it. Stand up if you love plants. Oh, look at all these plant people here. Laura, look, it's all plant people. <laughs> um, stand up if you chronically overwater your plants. I see you people. I'm with you. Uh, stand up if you grew up in nature. Oh, a lot of you. Me too. Stand up if you're dreaming of moving to the country. Oh, <laughs> Linda, I see you wave your arms. <laughs> All right, one more. Stand up if your profession has to do with nature, wilderness, or plants. What is it? You're a floral designer. A remedy? A syrup shop, that is so cool. Nutrition, education, and gardening. Scent design. design. Yes. Wow, that's so cool. All right. Thank you for playing along. So whenever registration, yeah. Whenever reg registration opens, I get really frenetic and I start. If you don't know, you can see who's attending. There's a button uh, by pointing there. And then I look at all the wonderful people that are attending. And I look at your profiles. And I see where you work. And I see what you do. And I see your freelance projects and whatever. And I want to point out, like, you are all so creative. Like the avatars, that your profile photos are really fun. Like Mira's, I really love, is Mira here? There she is, hi Mira. Um, Alex really wins this one because he took a photo of his border protection photo print, which are so hideous. Um, Chris, I know Chris is here, love, love the, the, ball, the ball thing. Um, also Shauna, really cool, like it. And then Susan, it's people like you that keep me up at night. I mean, is it, I love Totoro, I really do. But what if somebody had a really good conversation with you and they want to find you afterwards and they can't because you, look, you don't look like Totoro, I assume. So, 
And then there's all the bagels and croissants and coffee cups that have never uploaded a photo. You might miss the most amazing opportunity of your life because people can find you. So please go home and upload a photo. Thank you. <laughs> all right. This month's theme is um, wilderness. So every, every month we have a, um, a global theme that all the chapters pick a speaker to. And uh, this month's theme was pick, uh, picked by the Chattanooga chapter. I like to say Chattanooga. And, and it was illustrated by Holly Cheston. And I am so excited to finally introduce Laura Chavez Silverman. She's a writer, creative director, branding consultant, and most of all, in 2017, she founded the Outside Institute to help people connect uh, with the healing and transformative, transformative powers of nature. Uh, she and her team offer nature-based education and experiences, in, including guided walks, uh, foraging, forest immersion, and the thing I'm really interested about, botanical mixology. She and her team have published three volumes of their field guides uh, to the Hudson and Upper Delaware Valley. I have one of them, and I love it. And while researching Laura, I fell into a deep Google rabbit hole, and during a prep for the call, one thing was for sure, that her, her love for life is very evident. And her, her curiosity shines through in everything she does, and she is what I call a divine feminine woman, and I'm very grateful she decided to make time uh, to come to and talk to us about the wilderness at our doorstep. Please give a rock star applause for Laura. Check, check, okay, good. Good morning, fellow creatives and fellow naturalists. It's really wonderful to be here. And I'm actually a little bit um, amazed that I made it because when Tina first reached out to invite me, I, I turned her down. I was like, you know, I just got back from two weeks in Europe and actually not that long after I got home, I. I was stricken down with these horrible fevers, and I've been like lying in bed with 103 fever for the last few weeks. And also, Tina, I don't really think that three weeks is enough time for me to prepare a 20-minute talk. So <laughs> could I do it next month? Or how about the month after that? Or, or maybe next year? <laughs> Creative morning speakers, they're just like us. <laughs> Anxious, neurotic, procrastinating. <laughs> But Tina, in all her infinite wisdom, wrote me back and she was like, look, as someone who gets asked to speak, I can tell you, short lead times can be very helpful. And this was the kicker, the theme this month is wilderness. Here, we native English speakers say wilderness, but you could say wilderness if you want. Um, and she couldn't think of another topic that would be more suited to me that was coming down the pike anytime soon. So of course, I had to say yes. And just as an aside, um, since then, this, this earlier this week, I got a diagnosis of anaplasmosis, which is a tick-borne disease that causes relapsing fevers. So um, I don't know what my vibe is like. I feel a tiny bit shaky. I'm on doxycycline now, and that seems to be helping me improve. Um, but I know that you're going to get me through this, right? Yeah. Yeah. We're good. So of course, the minute I said yes, my mind went completely blank. I was like, wilderness? What, what does that even mean? And like one second before I Googled it, I had a brain flash. And I realized that I had just seen in this amazing little book I was reading by Terry Tempest Williams called When Women Were Birds. If you haven't read it, I, I highly recommend it to you. Anyway, she makes reference to the wilderness letter written by Wallace Stegner, an amazing Pulitzer Prize winning author and environmental writer. You probably know about him. And so I did go online at that point, and I was like, what is this wilderness letter? Let me find it, which I did, and it was there in its entirety. And I also found on YouTube a recording of Stegner himself reading it, so I was able to hear it in his own words. And I want to start today by reading you a brief excerpt from This is Wilderness Letter, written by Wallace Stegner, to the Outdoor Recreation Resources Review Commission in 1960. 
What I want to speak for is not so much the wilderness uses, valuable as those are, but the wilderness idea, which is a resource in itself. Something will have gone out of us as a people if we ever let the remaining wilderness be destroyed. If we permit the last virgin forests to be turned into comic books and plastic cigarette cases. If we drive the few remaining members of the wild species into zoos or to extinction. If we pollute the last clear air and dirty the last clean streams and push our paved roads through the last of the silence so that never again will Americans be free in their own country from the noise, the exhausts, the stinks of human and automotive waste. And so that never again can we have the chance to see ourselves single, separate, vertical, and individual in the world, part of the environment of trees and rocks and soil, brother to the other animals, part of the natural world, and competent to belong in it. We simply need that wild country available to us, even if we never do more than drive to the edge and look in. For it can be a means of reassuring ourselves of our sanity as creatures, a part of the geography of hope. It being Stegner, of course, it's a beautifully written letter, no surprise there. But I find something painful in this idea that you know, we need to be standing at the edge of this pristine vastness in order to feel connected to the land and to ourselves as wild creatures. And it's also painful to think that these issues that sound so topical in this letter, they seem so relevant right now, they've really been part of the conversation for more than 60 years. Something about that coming to the edge of pristine vastness in order to feel connected, there's something in there that I would really like to dispel. I mean, do we really have to go so far from home to tap into that sense of awe and wonder and interconnectedness? Why do we? <laughs> Remember what it's like to travel? You get out in the world and, and all your senses open up and you're, you're seeing things closer and in greater detail and, and you're, you're smelling and you're hearing and you're looking and you're touching and you're feeling. It's like you're a sponge, like you're trying to commit all this stuff to memory. You're collecting all these impressions, right? But really, you're just kind of skimming the surface, you know? You don't live there. What would happen if you brought that same intensity of awareness, that same kind of curiosity to your everyday life. When you live where you live, you have an opportunity to go deep. If I get near this, is it going to be buzzy? I'll stay over here. <laughs> so it's all about going deep. That's what I want to talk to you about. During that first pandemic spring, all these people came up to me. They were like, wow! Have you heard all the birds? There's so many more birds this year. It's incredible. I, I, I'm just amazed at all the birds. Or, oh, I went out into my yard and, and I discovered all these new species of wildflowers growing there, never seen them before. What is up with that? And I was like, guess what? This year is the same as every year. It's you that are different. Because what happened was people were slowing down, right? And they were staying in one place more and they were paying attention. So they were able to tune into these, these countless micro seasons that we have, right? These incremental shifts that, that only are observable if you're in the same place paying attention. So what would it be like to really live where you live? What kind of relationship could you cultivate with the wilderness at your doorstep? And why would you want to? I mean, really, what's in it for you, right? Well, it turns out that when you get outside into places with plants and trees and water, it's really good dope. 
I heard that phrase, I read it rather, in the comments section on a New York Times article that I was reading. This article was about how scientists have determined the exact number of minutes per week that you need to be out in nature to maximize your health benefits. <laughs> yeah, they figured it out. Can you guess how many minutes that would be? Can I have some educated? Or? Tina read the article. 120 minutes a week, two hours a week, that's all you need, you're good, right? And so I was like, let me go to the comment section because I'm interested, when something seems polarizing to me, I love reading those comments. <laughs> and sure enough, Matt from Tallahassee had weighed in and he was saying to people, oh yeah, you can get out there and get your two hours, but watch out because you're going to want a whole lot more because nature is really good dope. <laughs> yeah. And there's powerful evidence that even just walking under the, for, uh, the canopy of a living forest is, is really good for your health, right? It lowers your blood pressure, it, it helps you with stress and anxiety, it makes you focus more intensely, um, all of these things. It even extends your life expectancy. You can be under some trees, you can live longer, yeah? Being out in nature helps you access your creativity. This is the crowd for that, yeah. It makes you more flexible in your thinking, more able to get in touch with new ideas. Now, that's amazing, isn't it? If you breathe in negatively ionized air, like what you inhale when you're near a waterfall, it does things to your brain waves that promote calm and clarity. Now, that's addictive. But do we really need all this kind of science to confirm what we, what we know in our bones? Our bodies remember. Our bodies hold this knowledge. And why wouldn't they? Because for nearly 200,000 years, we lived close to the land as hunter-gatherers, in sync with the seasons and cycles, intimate with the plants and animals. Do you think that made an impression on us? It's written in our DNA, right? It's, it's really who we are. And I think it's also a large part of what, why foraging is so freaking popular to this day. I mean, I used to think it was an, ex, an expression of our extractive conditioning, this idea that you would arrive at the edge of the forest and treat it like, I don't know, a Wegmans, right? <laughs> what can I get? What can I get? What can I get? I didn't even want to call my walks foraging walks. I was like, let me just call them guided nature walks, even though we always talked about edible and medicinal plants. I just didn't want to reinforce that sense that we're all out there for what we can get, right? But then I kind of put my empathy hat on. You know, I thought about it a little more, and I was like, you know, that hunter-gatherer thing, that instinct, that is strong. That is powerful. Of course it's still in, in us right? It's in our lizard brain. We've all got that. And if I'm being 100% honest with you, that thing of arriving at the edge of the forest, hoping for some chanterelles, that's not exactly foreign to me. In fact, it might be actually how I got started on this whole journey. Yeah. My husband says that foraging taps into all of the things I love best. Delicious food, beautiful nature, a good workout, and a great bargain. <laughs> I'm a cook, so I wanted to find some morels or some hen of the woods or whatever, right? So what did I do? I got some field guides and I started teaching myself. And what happened? My whole life changed for the better. And eight years later, I founded the Outside Institute because I just, I had to find a way to share with other people these incredibly healing and transformative experiences. There's just no way to overestimate pleasure as a reason for being outside. The sheer beauty of it, the gorgeous colors, the amazing fragrances, the sensuality of diving into water, 
of feeling the air on your skin, of crunching an aromatic, sweet, delicious cluster of black locust blossoms. I mean, you just can't beat it, what it does to you to be outside soaking all this stuff in. And I'm here to tell you today, this is your birthright. You were born to this. So with that in mind, it's probably maybe 50-50 that when you step outside, you'll feel at home, right? And what will reinforce that sense of belonging is the fact that nature is an entirely judgment-free zone. The wind doesn't care how much you weigh. Birds don't notice if you color your hair or not. No squirrel is ever going to run up to you and be like, hey, where'd you get those boots? <laughs> it's not going to happen, right? You get to just show up exactly as you are and feel accepted. Or maybe you get outside and you don't feel so comfy, right? That's OK, too. I mean, if you think about it, there's a lot of innate things that still need to be learned. Just because something's natural doesn't necessarily mean it feels natural. I take a lot of people out in the woods that are like, they're like bugs, spiders, ticks, eh, what's happening? And, and I'm like, just chill and be willing to step outside your comfort zone just a little bit. And you know what happens? Sooner or later, that good dope kicks in and you realize you're right where you're meant to be. Yeah. When you make these amazing experiences, part of your daily life, your life changes. You're able to cultivate a kind of intimacy to get that sense of belonging. It's, it's life affirming. So you're probably like, OK, I, well, how do I start? You know. Luckily for us, the brilliant poet Mary Oliver left so many words of wisdom for those of us yearning to get back to our true nature, including these. To pay attention. This is our endless and proper work. Believe it or not, the wilderness is at your doorstep, even right here in New York City. All you have to do is open up Engage your senses and be willing to draw it in. You'll be rewarded for it. So what do you do? You step outside and you keep your phone in your pocket. That's essential. <laughs> Despite those sirens and all that unwanted noise, if you have your earbuds in, you don't hear the birds or the sounds of the wind. You'll want to. If you can, walk in a park or some green space or near a body of water. But if you can't, that's fine. Wherever you go, I promise there will be plants and critters for you to enjoy. Look up at the sky. Study the cloud formations. Check out the vestiges of last night's moon. In the city, peregrine falcons roost on skyscrapers, right? Giant puffball mushrooms are cropping up in abandoned lots. On the West Side Highway, I've seen rose hips, burdock, wild carrot, even chicken of the woods mushrooms thriving. It's all out there. And as you walk, you'll notice yourself becoming hyper aware, but at the same time, kind of dreamy and semi conscious. Your monkey mind will quiet down if you just focus on this place in this moment. You'll see a bumblebee making its way into a flower. You'll notice some intricate designs underneath the bark of that tree. 
you'll see how the leaves are rustling in the wind. And from this place of genuine curiosity, questions will bubble up. You'll be like, what is that bee doing in that flower? Pollination. <laughs> Who made those incredible designs under that tree bark? The emerald ash borer beetle. What leaves are those shaking like that in the wind? Quaking aspen. Well, the answers can come from so many different places. Find someone like me, a naturalist, to take you out for a walk and glean knowledge that way. We're around. Ask the Google. Internet, incredible font of information. There's even apps like PlantNet and iNaturalist that will help you identify virtually any plant just from a simple photo that you take with your phone. Watch a YouTube video. Get some field guides. We've created three. However you like to learn, try a little of this, a little of that. The information is out there for you. So do we have time for a little show and tell? Yeah, OK, good. So I want to show you a few of the things that sparked my curiosity and provoked me to have deeper engagement with the world around me. I think you probably all recognize this as an antler, right? So um, this is from a white-tailed deer. And these are ubiquitous where I live in the Catskills. And um, in the dozen or so years that I've been living upstate now, I'd only found maybe three or four of them. And I was curious, we have so many deer, why wasn't I finding more antlers? So I did a little research, and I discovered that um, bucks, which are the male deers, grow new antlers every year for mating season, and then they shed them at the end of the year. So I was like, who knew? They shed their antlers every year? You'd think the forest floor would be littered with these things, right? Well, it turns out that they're an important food source for all kinds of animals. Chipmunks, squirrels, porcupine, basically anything with teeth, even other deer. They're eating these for the calcium and phosphorus and minerals that they contain. So the reason that you don't find them all the time is because they're a popular snack. How about this? Anybody seen anything like this before? You know what this is? It's a plant phenomenon. I found this growing on a high bush blueberry. But I'd seen it in like slightly different iterations on a bunch of other plants and trees. Never knew what it was. I was like, that thing looks like a witch's broom. It's called witch's broom. <laughs> it's a stress reaction. So like an aphid or a virus or a bacteria or a fungus irritates the plant somehow. And the plant creates this profusion of growth in reaction to that. And people call it witch's broom. <laughs> now, this behemoth, shedding bits and bobs, um, does anyone recognize this? Chaga. You probably know that from your trendy local coffee shop, right? <laughs> Chaga latte, anybody? Yeah, well, if you haven't actually seen chaga, it's this hard mycelial mass that extracts betulinic acid and other immune-boosting chemicals from the birch tree. And um, in a tiny little bit of synergy, I was peeking out wistfully at that garden through that window when I got here, and I saw there's a birch tree out there, and I think it has a little bit of incipient chaga growing on it. So chaga has amazing anti-cancer properties. It's a traditional medicine of the indigenous people of the Ural Mountains for thousands of years. I read that as far back as the 12th century, a Tsar in Russia was drinking tea made from chaga to cure his lip cancer. So these are the kinds of things that you come across when you keep your eyes open. I know what you're thinking. You're like, she lives in the Catskills. Of course she's going to come across that kind of stuff. But honestly, there's chaga right out there. And 
I once saw a giant detura bush, which is jimson weed or loco weed, for those of you who may have heard of it. It's a powerfully hallucinogenic plant. It was growing right on an island in the middle of Third Avenue. Yeah. And about six weeks from now, a whole bunch of trees in the East Village are going to drop ripe mulberry fruits. So it's everywhere. Nature is so bountiful. But I ask you to remember, she is not a retail boutique. This is not so much about what you can take. Although, as you see, there's plenty to take, and it's there for us, right? You have to do it mindfully and sustainably, learn about the foraging rules and regulations. But it's really more about this incredible web of life that you belong to. Like all the best relationships, the one you have with nature has to be reciprocal. The indigenous tribes have a wonderful tradition of leaving something on the land as tribute and gratitude. It's often just like a little sprinkling of tobacco. What will you do? Maybe you'll pick up some trash or some dog poo. God, this city is so gross. Maybe you'll start giving pigeons some respect. It could be as simple as that. Maybe you'll plant some milkweed on your fire escape to support the endangered monarch butterfly. Maybe you'll join me in moving dead animals off the road. I like to give them a more beautiful, more graceful final resting spot. I don't want you to worry about what you're going to do. What I want you to do is step outside with an open heart. And the answers will reveal themselves to you. I promise. May the forest be with you. <laughs>
or one evolution in my understanding of hunting is that now hunters can work together to protect the land by uh, you know, bidding for licenses to hunt. Is there some way that foragers are sort of collaborating on land conservation, or how do they negotiate like the use of land? Fantastic question. Thanks for bringing it up. I could do a whole talk just on that. Um, the thing about foraging is that it's largely illegal. It's illegal to forage on state land, which makes me feel irate from one point of view. But from another point of view, if you see the um, lack of respect that we've been taught for the land, those laws are there for protection, right? So there's kind of two sides to that coin. So that's why I kind of dropped in casually that if you're going to forage, you should really read up on the rules and regulations. Um, but to answer your question more specifically, you know, there's lots of ways that foragers can work with the land in ways that are beneficial. One of those ways is to seek out quote unquote invasive plants. I like to call them introduced species. But we often have um, plants that were brought here either as ornamentals um, or by accident. And they're thriving in this climate, but they often will outcompete native species, um, which is problematic for a variety of reasons. I used to just be like, kumbaya, like the plants are here, they're innocent, everybody should just do their thing. And then I got a little bit more educated and I realized that there's a lot of ways in which um, indigenous insect and animal life co-evolves with native plants. Um, and if you start losing native plants, it greatly affects the biodiversity. So, I mean, in the end, I do think that nature will strike the balance. Certainly, the window of um, time that we're looking at, like 100 years, is nothing. So the idea that we know, you know what should be foraged or what should be planted or you know, any of that kind of stuff is kind of ridiculous in, in, a, in the grand scheme of things. But the bottom line is, you know, in order to forage, if you want to find those chanterelles or those morels or whatever it is, you quickly understand that you have to come into relationship with the total ecology because mushrooms live in, in symbiotic relationships with certain trees and they grow in certain seasons and pretty soon you're learning to identify all the plants and understanding how things live together in harmony and seeing, you know, the fact that bears and foxes and all, birds all eat blueberries too, so you can't go to that bush and take all the blueberries. I mean, it's a very complex and nuanced, um, which is why I, I'm very resistant to just teach foraging, because you can't just teach foraging, just like you can't just teach hunting, really. You have to understand the whole landscape and the interconnectedness of everything. That was kind of wordy. Did I answer you? Yeah. If, if the person asking the question could take their mask down, I would really appreciate it. And also stand up when you ask a question, please. Kate, can you stand up when you ask a question? Thank you. Hi. Um, it's wonderful, Laura, thank you. Um, given that at a molecular level you could say everything is nature, what is your feeling about going into the urban environment and finding nature in the sort of ossified way? That's something that used to be a plant that has become ultimately, say, a brick. Can you find nature in where, the, where you can't find actual plants? Is there such a thing as a wilderness that is concrete? What a beautiful question, so poetic. Um, it, it's funny because one of my little tropes is I like to say that we've created this false dichotomy. There's, there's the natural world, and then there's the world inhabited by humans, I guess those are the two things. But really, what? No, there's just one world, and we're all living in it together. So yes, of course, nature is everywhere. A lot of people during the pandemic would, would say to me, like, I can't even get outside. You know, hopefully, people at least had a window. And, and a window automatically connects you to nature. But I've read studies that say that even if you don't have a window, just looking at a, an artistic representation of nature is beneficial to your system. So, so I think what you're saying is that nature is everywhere, and I'm completely agreeing with you. I mean, from the linen smock I'm wearing to the juice I drank this morning to the weed I'm smoking, it's all nature, right? 
Yeah. Hi. Um, could you talk a bit about if there was a catalyst? It sounds like maybe you moved from the city to the country or um, like a place where nature is more accessible. Can you talk about if there was a catalyst to making that decision and making that move? Sure. We'll get a little personal, I guess. <laughs> um, what happened was I was living in LA um, in the early aughts. And um, the LA lifestyle, right, Jenny? My friend is here who used to hike with me a lot there. Um, I was married to a man who was dying of cancer. And I found that one of the few places I could find solace was hiking hiking in the Palisades, one of my favorite places. And um, he ended up dying, and I ended up moving back to New York. And when I got back here, I was like, I, I got to find a place outside the city. Um, and so I ended up finding a little cottage in the Catskills, and that's how I, I first went up there. And then I was going back and forth for a few years. And then in 2009, my husband and I just decided to move up full time. So really, you know, I grew up in nature. I grew up in Santa Cruz, California, where the redwoods meet the ocean, and loved tide pooling and was really into being outside. And then I went super urban, and I was like a Prada-wearing creative director stomping the concrete in New York City for many years. So it really wasn't until I moved back to LA that I kind of re-engaged. And, and it was a, in a, out of a feeling of, of desperation and depletion and grief um, that I turned to, to nature. Anybody else? We have time for one more question. Make it good. Jane. <laughs> I was wondering, I've heard um, that we've overforaged ramps recently, like as it's become like a trendy thing in restaurants. Are there other plants that um, we're seeing the same trends with? Um, yeah, the ramp question. That's always a good one. You know, it's really interesting because a ginseng um, grew very, very abundantly here in the Northeast. And in the 19th century, um, it was a very popular entrepreneurial business to go into. Harvesting ginseng was, a lot of it was being sent to Asia for medicinal use. And it was so over harvested that there's very, very little ginseng left. I've only ever seen it once in the wild. So it's not really something new, this ramp thing. You know, there's, there's always these crazes. In fact, when I was doing some research about ramps, I discovered that Chicago is a bastardization of the indigenous word for ramps, Chicago. And that Lake Michigan used to be completely ringed with ramps, no longer, over harvested. So, you know, anything that becomes trendy, like chaga, um, is in danger of being over harvested. And, you know, I think our consciousness has been raised so much around things like supply chains and provenance. Um, so there's, you know, there's a greater awareness when you're buying something that you should understand if it was reputably sourced. Um, but I, I think the I think ramps are going to be okay in the Northeast. Um, actually, I, I I know people that are planting their own ramp patches and kind of tending them in the way that I think the indigenous people probably did. So with a little bit of education, I think you know, we can bring back some of these plants and we can learn how to coexist with them in a way that doesn't damage their populations. Thanks, you guys. Thank you so much, Laura. That was wonderful and just what our hearts needed. Um, 
before I let you go, I want to first point out that take some plants with you. You can do it. <laughs> also, whoever brought Bruno, it says Bruno here. Who's Br who brought Bruno? I am adopting Bruno. I love a named plant. I will, I will hopefully do him justice. Thank you for Bruno. Um, take a plant, please. You can do it. Um, I want to thank our event volunteers. Without them, we couldn't do it. Uh, Cece, Eduardo, Emily, Christina, Sky, Alicia, Megan, and my dog, Bo. This was his first event. Um, <laughs> Her, her. I keep saying he. This is so funny. The German. Also, I must say, I've lived in America for 23 years, and my kids, they're 12 and 16, they're getting a real kick out of me mispronouncing word, words, and they keep track of them, so they keep saying it wrong to me, and wilderness will be part of that now, so I'm owning it. I'm owning it. Um, I also want to thank, again, Connie, you're, you're a rock star. You're an anchor of this volunteer community. Thank you so much. Also, Monte. Monte, did I say your name correctly? Good. Thank you for taking photos and showing us all how good we look. And again, thank you to Lucien for hosting us today. Um, and next month, we'll be here again on July 8th with Casper Turquoise, a dear friend of mine, a truly magical human. Uh, he wrote a book, The Power of Rachel. The theme will be spirituality. He thinks a lot about where people go that don't feel like they belong to church, but they are. They want to belong to some community. If that's a topic that interests you, you should come. It's going to be really interesting. And as always, I want to leave you with a quote. Everything in the universe has a rhythm. Everything dances by Maya Angelou. Thank you for being here. Thank you for tuning in in the live stream. See you next month.